Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land we, um, we currently make, as well as the Mirawong Gadjurong people, um, who are the traditional owners of the place that I currently live at the moment. Um, this is where I live, up in Kununurra. Um, it's a little bit, a little bit far away from from other places. Um, actually, we're closer to the the capital cities um, for Indonesia, um, Papua New Guinea, and Timor Leste than we are to Canberra and um, and Perth. So, the comments that I make today are more about my reflections of working in the East Kimberley, as well as a, as a reflection um, and some input from my research that I've done over the last few years. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> um, Kununurra is, is home to Lake Argyle um, and the Ord River Irrigation System. So we have a fairly significant agricultural um, industry there. Um, when I first started my research, when I first went to, to Kununurra, it was quite a diverse agricultural community. Now um, there's significant um, um, use of, of land with um, sandwood plantation. So a lot of the small... Um, Family-owned farms have now moved on, and Sandalwood now has um, taken the place of what was traditional um, farming areas. With um, the East Kimberley, we had the Ord River, um, the Ord Guard um, Regional Biosecurity Plan, um, and basically that was around um, introducing plans and policies and practice for people in the community. Um, to basically address biosecurity, to raise awareness, um, to, to address and change behaviour um, and people's attitudes towards biosecurity. Um, one of the key things around um, Ordguard was that if people see something different, then they could do something about it. There's an amazing amount of work being done in biosecurity, phenomenal amount of work being done in biosecurity. But if that doesn't infiltrate out into the community, then, I mean, we don't get the community's um, um, support and, and help in addressing biosecurity issues. So our little community of, of, of um, Kununurra, we have a population of about 6,000 people. We have 11,000 hectares under um, irrigable um, uh, land. Um, and that is about to expand into the Northern Territory as well. Um, so we, we talk about a whole of a community approach to biosecurity. Um, so yeah, it means that all sectors of our community can play a role in addressing biosecurity issues. So this is a definition of biosecurity that's come through from Biosecurity Australia. So it's not only about protecting the economy, the environment and people's health from pests and diseases, but it's also trying to um, deal and control with, with those pests and diseases once they actually arrive in our communities. Um, so where we live, we, the Shire of um, Wyndham East Kimberley, has a total um, land mass of 122,000 hectares. And we have a population of around 15 to 20,000 people. So if we can get as much help in addressing biosecurity issues over that 122,000 hectares, um, then it reduces the, the role um, and the impact on our government agencies. The current mechanisms in place um, in the Ord River irrigation um, region sort of for bio, to address bio, or to control and address bi biological incursions um, rely on um, the restricted movement of, of plant material into the community. We have a quarantine checkpoint on the WA Northern Territory border. Um, there is fly, uh, fruit fly trapping across, I think there's about 230 fly traps across the East Kimberley. Um, we do radio interviews, newspaper articles, quarantine, uh, quarantine checks at the airport, um, honesty bins, road signage pamphlets and websites. With all of this in place, there's still incursions that happen in the Ord River irrigation area. Um, or the Ord River, Ord River Irrigation Area has area freedom status, which means that we um, do not have the same issues that other parts of Australia have in terms of pests and diseases, which means that we can export um, our produce to a whole range of different national and international markets because of that. With all of the information um, that is available to people, there is significant amounts of information available about biosecurity. 
Um, there is an assumption, though, that the vast volume of information that's out there will bring around a change in people's attitudes and behaviours towards biosecurity. It doesn't matter how many pamphlets people produce, how many websites people produce, it will not affect change. When I did my research, um, a lot of people saw um, brochures but didn't actually pick them up, read them and actually do anything about it. They saw them but didn't do anything about it. So it would be relatively unwise to assume that producing websites and pamphlets is just um, the panacea um, to address biosecurity issues. The other important thing in our community is that not too many people know what biosecurity is or understand biosecurity at all. So biosecurity is very well known amongst um, people within the agricultural industry, um, very well known within government departments. Um, but beyond that, um, there's very little recognition um, of biosecurity um, in terms of behaviour change um, and practice. When our population in Kununurra has 40% um, Indigenous people, um, our population of Indigenous people um, travels quite vastly across traditional lands. Um, there, if you asked what biosecurity was um, for them or what it meant for them, um, I know which we did, and no idea. Um, some of the young people that I spoke to as well um, created images in their head of uh, people in green suits and, and biological warfare and all those sorts of things when we, when we talked about biosecurity. So how do we get that large volume of information um, to actually bring about a change in people's attitudes um, and behaviours? So we look at the bottom of this this hierarchical scale. And we said there's a large amount of information that's available. So people will only take up um, information if it's in a format, um, in a, communicated in a style um, that is appropriate for them. So we need to identify and develop different communication styles and systems uh, depending on who we're talking to. So the information and the language we use um, potentially at a Department of Agriculture and Food um, in WA might be extremely different to the language that we would use in a classroom or in a remote Aboriginal community. People will only take up that information if they perceive it to have an impact on them. So people will not look at biosecurity unless they have a perception that it's going to impact on their lives. <coughs> One of the key things um, that happened while I've been in Kununurra is the um, thank you that would, be, um, would be the introduction of cane toads, the little wave of cane toads, big wave of cane toads actually, bloody big wave of cane toads, <laughs> started to move across from the east. Thank you so much, Rona. Move across from the Northern Territory. People were motivated to change. People's behaviours changed because of the threat of cane toads coming in from the Northern Territory. People saw that their local environments, their local fishing spots, their local <coughs> water holes, their, their, their houses were going to be impacted by cane toads coming across. So they chose to do something about that. Their actions, their behaviours changed. In terms of... Um, the agricultural industry, that's been there for 40, 40 years. And people's attitudes towards changing um, their approaches to biosecurity in terms of agriculture has been fairly limited. And they're less likely to want to change um, their attitudes towards biosecurity in terms of vast um, plantations of sandalwood, which are owned by national organisations that don't live in the community. So depending on that intensity of the impact that um, that biological uh, biosecurity threat will have on their individual, um, their well-being or their welfare will impact um, and motivate um, them to change their behaviours. So, if there's a low capacity for change, uh, sorry, if there's a low impact on people's lifestyles and, and livelihoods, then there's likely to be a low capacity for change. If there's a high impact on people's livelihoods and lifestyles, then there's likely to be um, a high capacity for change. So interest is generated by local people um, and change is possible. If people believe there's going to be an impact on them personally, 
on their families, their workplace, their social networks, their recreation and leisure pursuits. There's a very large diamond mine that is not far from Kananara. There was rumours going around that, oh, it might be closing, oh, the Chinese um, uh, might be buying that one. People didn't really think too much about it until one day um, 350 contractors were put off and then all hell broke loose in Kununurra because of the chain, the chain reaction that would happen if something happened to their lifestyle and livelihood. Um, so people were pretty ambivalent um, and pretty um, not really taking things seriously until they actually saw that there was a, a genuine threat to, to lifestyle um, and livelihood. Hey, Dad. Um, so engagement. So, and when we're talking about community engagement, we're talking about a personal relationship between people. It's an exchange of um, information uh, between people um, across a whole range of um, community sectors. Um, we use relevant, accessible and common language um, and other communication tools to provide that information. So when we talk about websites and when we talk about brochures, they are certainly effective, but they'll be more effective as secondary communication tools. What is so important is having a one-on-one -on -one relationship, one-on-one -on -one contact with an individual to share that information. So engagement is not consultation. Consultation can be very, very effective, but consultation can also be very, very selective. Um, we also talk about, and I hate, sorry, this is my personal little, my little dig, but I hate the, the term capacity building. It drives me nuts. We make an assumption then our communities do not have capacity and it's paternalistic and it's horrible, I hate it. <laughs> um, and I hear it all the time um, up, in, up in the Kimberley. We're assuming that our communities do not have capacity to change and us as good gutty white whitefellas coming in and, and making change in our communities. Um, consultation can be selective. Um, I spoke with an amazing young farmer. Um, she had grown up in Kununurra. She had gone off to university, done her um, agriculture um, degree. Um, there was consultation done by the Shire about what sort of agriculture or what agriculture can look like in the East Kimberley. Um, and she was um, really pissed off. Um, I do that, sorry, I'm from the East Kimberley and swear words just pop out every now and again. <laughs> um, but she was really pissed off because the consultation that was done was done with her father and her father's generation. Um, and that generation of farmers have done an amazing amount of work and worked bloody hard, but she was the next generation and no consultation was done with her about what her vision was for Kununurra, what she thought um, she would like to, to do in years to come. She had no plans on leaving Kununurra um, and her voice was just as important and as valid as her father's, but never given the opportunity because um, the assumption was that, oh, those people that have been there for 20 years, um, we'll talk to them first. And that's, that's absolutely important. Um, people of all generations have, have valid points of view, have different perceptions. Um, but yeah, she was quite annoyed that that consultation had really been about, well, what does Dad think? And, da and, and other people of, of his generation. <clears throat> so in terms of community engagement, so we build on the strengths of the social networks that exist within our communities. The idea is around exchanging information as opposed to information provision. We look at websites and we look at brochures. Um, Brochures are basically one way um, forms of, um, sorry, one directional forms of communication. One of the great quotes that I got from one of my friends when I was doing my research was, you can't have a conversation with a brochure. And that's one of the things that people miss very much. They can get a lot of information, but they actually enjoy the engagement, the exchange of information, the asking of questions. What is this about? Um, also, that process of engagement gives voices to those people who are quite often silent. So, yep, we get to hear a lot from the chairperson, we get to hear a lot from those people who are on council, or we get to hear a lot from, from the CEOs of, or, or um, directors of different companies. But we actually don't get to hear the voices that are beyond that. And particularly 
in a place like Kununurra, where there's a large sort of different fractions and different subsections within the community, um, we don't hear from Indigenous people. We don't hear from young people. We don't hear from tourists um, in terms of our planning around biosecurity. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so community engagement is also a process. It's how we do it. It's not necessarily uh, an end result type of thing. How we actually engage with the community is, is actually the most important thing. Um, so community engagement also focuses on locally driven ideas and to address locally identified issues. So one of my questions would be, how does the stuff, how does the really important stuff that happens up in Kununurra make its way down to Perth and Canberra to influence decisions on policy? So it can't happen by magic. And so there has to be that relationship that's developed between um, the mob up there with the mob down there. It's also around that idea of ideas and solutions bubbling up from below. Just a quick little thing on relationships. Most important, this is from a, a good friend of mine, Tim Muirhead in Perth. These key elements are absolutely essential in, in developing relationships. And as people from organisations, it's so important that we still develop relationships based on honesty, respect and trust. Yep, people might not necessarily know us personally, but they know our organisation. If we trust our organisation, if they respect our organisation, if we give them the opportunity to ask questions of our organisation, there is a stronger sense um, of relationship there. Right, I'm going to have to quickly zip through. This also allows for authentic and meaningful relationships to develop. So there is nothing worse, and we hear it all the time from our mob up in Kununurra, and no disrespect to anyone in the room, but they do get very sick of people coming up from somewhere else and wanting to have a conversation with them. Um, there is no authenticity in that. Um, people come in on their, on their morning flight and, and bugger off on the afternoon flight, and that's the extent of their relationship. And that really does give people the shits a bit. Sorry. Um, right, so just some key points to consider before I finish. Um, engagement um, is an interaction between people. So organisations cannot engage with people. Organisations are responsible, uh, organisations are reliant on those key people within their organisations to actually make contact with people outside. Um, the strength, this is a really important um, point, um, the strength of people's relationships will influence um, and um, increase the volume of information exchange and influence um, those assumptions we have about that information being true. So if you have a really strong relationship with somebody, um, you're more likely to believe that information to be true. If you have a disrespectful or a dishonest relationship with someone, you're not likely to believe them. So the strength of your relationship will impact on the volume of information that's shared and that level of authenticity as well. Um, so the other in interesting thing is that biosecurity is more likely to be adopted at an individual level first. We talk about biosecurity across communities, but it's more likely to happen at an individual level first than it is at a community level. So if we can start introducing biosecurity strategies in the household, um, at our local um, national park, at our favourite fishing hole, people are much more likely to introduce that level of biosecurity awareness in their own environment and that information can then get shared. For young people say, um, yeah we saw these weeds at this waterhole, have you seen the cane toads down there? And they would say, yep, there's been an exchange of information, there's been a conversation that happens between say young people or indigenous people about biosecurity issues that happen in the area which will then influence um, their biosecurity actions as well. Right. Um, so one of those other key points is biosecurity information is currently being provided. It needs to be exchanged. Local people need to have the opportunity to influence the policies and patterns of behaviour um, that happens outside of their community. They need to have the opportunity to put their hand up and say, this is really important for us. Um, and we would like you to hear that. Um, 
really un other interesting thing is that our learning, our, the third point down, much of our learning is gained um, through experience, um, through actual participation. So by understanding what a weed looks like, understanding what bugs look like, um, absolutely um, then is around um, transferring that information into a, um, a practical sort of experience. So um, in our local community newspaper, we have a little section on what's the current weed of the month which is interesting, but it would be much more effective to actually have that weed, put it into a pot, and down at the community markets on a Saturday morning where people can touch it, can see it, can ask questions of that person who is actually putting that information on display. All right, last one. And again, um, certainly an environment needs to be fostered where organisations, whether it's in Perth, Canberra, Darwin, wherever, um, have an opportunity to, to engage and develop relationships with people outside of those um, organisations. So we also need to have systems in place to measure what we do. Um, we're very good at putting stuff out there, um, so there's been no measurements of the effectiveness of pamphlets, um, of websites um, out in the community in terms of raising awareness on biosecurity. Um, we have to continue to do the things that um, we do well, do less of the things that we don't do so well, the most important thing is it costs nothing to develop a relationship with someone. The information, the knowledge that that person has could walk past you if you don't spend five minutes. I mean, I, my partner hates coming shopping with me because I would spend two hours in there having a bit of a chat with everyone and it's like rah, rah, rah. And yeah, by the end of it, it's like everyone's grumpy because <laughs> it takes so long for me to get out of the shopping centre. But it costs nothing to develop relationships. But in terms of biosecurity outcomes, it can cost a lot if we don't. So if we don't develop relationships, it can cost a lot. All right, thanks.